All right, everybody, we are moving on to the unit of ecology. All right, what is ecology? Ecology is pretty much organisms and their environment. So to answer the question, what is ecology? It's the study of interactions that take place between organisms and their environment. It explains how living organisms affect each other and the world they live in. A couple key words we're going to need to know about um, are habitat and niche. Uh, habitat is simply the place a plant or an animal lives. So a habitat is kind of like its home, where it lives. And niche, some people also pronounce it niche, but I say niche, is an organism's total way of life. It's its role or its job. You may have heard of it called its ecological niche. But a niche is just another name for a job. What's its purpose? What does it do in its environment? couple other uh, words you need to talk about um, the non-living environment so this is everything that's you know not a plant or an animal or a human or something like that um, abiotic factors abiotic means not living so abiotic factors the non-living parts of an organism's environment examples include air uh, air currents temperature moisture light soil things like that abiotic factors affect um, organisms lives Okay, so although, although they're not living, they do have an, an effect on an organism's life. All right, now going back to the living environment. We said abiotic because of that prefix a. That means not or the opposite of whatever follows it. And what follows abiotic is biotic factors. So bio, that prefix b-i-o, it represents life or living things. So biotic factors are all living organisms that inhabit, meaning live, uh, in an environment. All organisms depend on others uh, directly or indirectly for food, shelter, reproduction, or protection. Okay, and this is good, starting talking about the different relationships between, you know, all living things. Okay, and the more we get into talk, talking about ecology, you'll realize how much we actually depend on other things around us that we probably take for granted. All right, so question now, <laughs> is this abiotic or biotic? which is the same thing, remember abiotic stands for living, I'm sorry, not living, and biotic stands for living. So basically, is this living or non-living? So going back with the vocab, abiotic or biotic? It is biotic, it's a type of a fish. Um, this tornado, is it abiotic or biotic? It is abiotic. This rock or the water, it doesn't matter either one, they are abiotic this right here is it abiotic or biotic it may not look like it's living but it is living it's biotic all right um, we're gonna talk about levels of organization you know um, organization is one of the uh, characteristics of life that things have to be organized right so um, this is pretty much are the different levels of organization when it comes to life you have an organism at the very top organisms is one member of a species all right um, population the next level is population population are many of the same species in the same area so an example you may have a lion if you have one lion that's an organism okay it's one member of a species and then if you have a family of lions where you have a mom dad maybe three kid lions <laughs> not kid lions you know but three uh, Young lions, I guess what you want to call them, uh, cub lions. I don't know what you want to what you want to call them, but basically, uh, a man. I keep saying man, a male and a female lion, and then their kids. That'll be a population because it's many of the same species. All right, and then a community would be many populations all in the same area. And then going on to uh, to a bigger would be a ecosystem, which are many communities that are pretty much living in the same area. And then a biosphere, which are all the biotic and abiotic factors in the same area interacting, uh, you know, with one another. All right. So just kind of going over the levels of organization. What level of organization would this be? One lion. Organism. Good job. Because it's just one member of a species. What level of organization is this? Let's see. We have... Uh, a family of elephants, family of giraffes, 
zebras, gazelles, all living in the same area. Those are all different species. So those are different populations all in the same area. That would be a community. What about this? What level of organization? We have a mother lion and a baby lion. They're the same species, but more than one member. It would be a population. We're going to move on from this. That's the activity we did, we did in class. Now we're talking about energy flow through an ecosystem. How does energy flow through an ecosystem? And we're going to talk about food chains, food webs, and energy pyramids. All right, so everything begins with the sun. All right, and talk about photosynthesis, which are pretty much how plants use the sunlight to make their own food. All right, down here is the formula for uh, for photosynthesis. You have carbon dioxide, which is CO2. You have water, which is H2O, and sunlight. Those will give you glucose, which is what the food the plant uses for food, and a byproduct of oxygen, O2. So that basically is saying that in order for photosynthesis to take place, you need carbon dioxide, water, sunlight, and then once the reaction takes place, it produces glucose, which is right here, which is what the food uses, the plant uses for food, and then oxygen, what animals and humans use to help breathe. All right, photosynthesis. It's a chemical reaction where green plants use water and carbon dioxide to store the source, to store the sun's energy in glucose. Energy is stored in glucose. Glucose is stored as starch in the plants. And here's just like a little diagram of how photosynthesis takes place. Okay. All right. A um, couple different more, uh, you know, vocabulary words that we're going to need it during this unit. Organisms that can make glucose during photosynthesis are called producers because they can produce their own food. Producers use most of the energy they make for themselves to just maintain, you know, normal life functions to grow and reproduce and things like that. Producers use cellular respiration to supply the energy they need to live. That's just the formula of cellular respiration, which is actually the opposite of um, photosynthesis. Those two uh, processes work hand in hand. So it says cellular respiration is the chemical reaction that releases the energy in glucose. Okay? Remember it said that photosynthesis, that's when the plant stores its energy in glucose or as glucose. And this is the reverse uh, reaction that releases the energy that, that was stored in glucose. And you see the example up here, now you have O2, oxygen, and glucose going into the chemical reaction and then producing out water, CO2, and then this is actually ATP energy. So this is energy that the um, animals or you know um, humans use in order to do different things. All right, the energy that is not used by the producer, remember we said that producers use most of the energy for maintaining normal life functions, you know, growing, developing, things like that. So the energy that is not used by the producer can be passed on to the organisms that cannot make their own energy. So for the example here, you have the plant that uses photosynthesis to make its own energy. And remember, it uses most of the energy that it makes. It stores a little bit, and then that little bit that is stored can be uh, transferred to this giraffe if the giraffe eats the leaves of the tree. Okay, So that same energy, that little bit that was stored, is now being passed on to this next level. Organisms that cannot make their own energy are called consumers because they have to consume or eat other things to get their energy. Consumers that eat producers to get their energy, which means, you know, things that only eat plants, are for first order or primary consumers. Okay, they're also called herbivores. The H is silent. Herbivores, plant eaters. If you think about, you know, when you were in elementary school, you learned about uh, dinosaurs. They're called plant eaters. <laughs> Herbivores is the technical term that we that we use. Again, you want to call them first order consumers or primary consumers. 
all right and this is just like earlier most of the energy the primary consumer gets from the producer is used by the consumer you know for normal life functions some of the energy uh, moves into the atmosphere as heat meaning some energy is lost at, in heat like when organisms sweat and things like that uh, we, we, we release a lot a lot of energy as heat uh, throughout sweat I mean through our sweats and things like that uh, some energy is prime I'm sorry some energy in the primary consumer is stored and not lost to the atmosphere um, or used by the consumer so basically we're saying that the majority of it is used by the consumer some is released as heat into the atmosphere and a little bit is stored the energy um, that is stored is available for other consumers to eat aka a predator okay just like the giraffe got the energy from the plant another consumer can get energy from this consumer if it eats the other animal <clears throat> a consumer that eats another consumer for energy is called a secondary or um, or a second order consumer they may be a carnivore or an omnivore a carnivore is an organism that only eats meat an omnivore are like humans where we can eat plants and animals okay? we can eat either or um, it may be a predator which is an organism that hunts its food and kills it to eat it or it could be a scavenger which is a organism that waits around for either someone else to kill an organism or just waits around for something to die and then it, it eats it and they'll pretty much eat whatever like a buzzard or a uh, catfish or a shrimp or a possum things like that most of the energy the second secondary consumer gets from the primary consumer is used by the secondary consumer so it's pretty much the same thing over and over again when a consumer eats something it uses the majority of the energy that it gets to maintain itself you know for normal life functions it may lose a little bit as heat and then it's going to store some whatever is stored can be passed on to the next organism all right if a consumer i'm sorry a consumer that eats a consumer that already ate a consumer <laughs> that's what you call a third order or a tertiary consumer a third or order or tertiary that's how you pronounce it tertiary consumer uh, again they may be a carnivore or an omnivore a predator or a scavenger consumers that eat producers and other consumers are called omnivores which we talked about earlier an omnivore can eat either a plant or an animal I'm sorry a plant yeah plant or animal um, omnivores eat uh, plants and animals same thing we said earlier so an omnivore eats plants and animals uh, consumers that uh, hunt and kill other animals we said are called predators the animals they hunt and kill are called prey so you may hear us refer to the predator prey relationship okay that is a nasty buzzard eating something else that's already been dead consumers that eat other dead consumers are called scavengers the transfer of energy from the Sun to producer to primary consumer then to high order consumers can be shown in the food chain all right I'll go through the path of energy you have the main energy coming from the Sun you have the plants using the energy from the Sun to grow and make their own food and then you have the grasshopper eating the plants getting that same energy that came from the Sun so that Sun's energy is passed on to the plant to the grasshopper to the frog that ate the grasshopper and then on to the hawk that ate the frog, that ate the grasshopper, that ate the grass, that got its energy from the sun. So that same energy is being passed on. Of course, the energy is decreasing a lot. Each, each level it goes to is decreasing by a whole lot. But that's how energy is cycled through a, um, an ecosystem. These are just other examples of food chains. You can look at them on your own. This is the energy pyramid. All right, it shows pretty much the different trophic levels, which are these, you know, going from producer to primary consumer to secondary consumer to tertiary consumer. All right. Um, it says the, uh, you know, this is what we just described earlier. The amount of available energy decreases 
for higher consumers. So you have more available energy down here in this level where the grass producers are, and then you have even less energy available here, even less energy available here, and even less energy available here. Uh, the amount of, of available energy decreases down the food chain. All right, so if we're looking at a food chain, it, it decreases down. Um, what else? It takes a large number of producers to su support a small number of primary consumers. So there's a, basically, you can look at the pyramid. There's a lot more room and space at the very bottom. And as you go up, there's less and less organisms. So it takes a lot more grass to support fewer amounts of rabbits. It takes a large number of primary consumers to support small number of secondary consumers. You can look at that between the, there's more rabbits than there are snakes. And there's more snakes than there are uh, hawks at the top. Again, this is just showing the energy pyramid, the different trophic levels. Trophic levels are producers, first order, second order, and third order consumers. And it shows energy loss as you go up the pyramid. So there's more energy down here, less here, less here, even less up here. All right, now we're going to move on talking about food webs. Food webs are interconnected food chains. They show the feeding relationships of an ecosystem. So this could be like, you know, you could take out a lot of these animals and it would be just like a regular food chain. But all these different arrows show pretty much the different possible source of energy for that animal. So it's showing that this owl could eat the squirrel if it wanted to. It could eat this, I can't see what that is right now. It looks like a skunk to me. Um, you know, a basically, it could eat a couple of different things. It could eat this little rabbit down here if it wanted to. It could also eat this uh, mouse over here if it wanted to. So there's a lot of different sources that it could get its energy from. So that's pretty much what a food web shows. It shows many different possible sources of energy for different animals. Here's another one right here. Pretty much the same thing. Uh, you could have the rabbit could eat this plant. And then that fox could eat that rabbit. And that could just be how it, how it happens. Or the rabbit could eat this plant. And then the hawk or owl could eat that rabbit. Okay, it doesn't have to be the fox. Okay, or you could have the... Uh, this, this bug right here could uh, eat this grass or plants. And then that bug could eat it. And then that bird could eat it, and then that fox could eat that bird. You know, it could go any way up here. All right? Just showing you the different possible sources of energy for each of these animals. That's, look at, that's shown in the food web. All right. Let's see what else we have. It says organisms don't live in isolation, meaning they don't live just by themselves. They depend on one another for food, shelter, and protection, and actually many other things, but that's just a few. Um, now we're going to describe the three different types of symbiotic relationship. Symbiotic relationships. First you have mutualism. Mutualism. It's an inter interaction in which both organisms in the relationship benefit. Uh, example, bees help to pollinate flowers while also receiving food. Because the bees, you know, go around from flower to flower, um, eating the nectar or, you know, uh, whatever is in the plant or in the, in the fruit or flower that the bee likes. But the bee is landing inside all the pollen. And the pollen's going to get on their legs and their, you know, bodies. And they're going from plant to plant, actually bringing around the pollen for that plant so they can reproduce. That's mutualistic. Both of them are benefiting. Both organisms are benefiting. In commensalism, you have one organism benefiting while the other is neither harmed or helped. All right. In parasitism, you have a relationship where one organism benefits while the other is harmed. So one is benefiting while the other is harmed. These are just examples that you can read to find out w which one you think it is. But here goes the answer at the bottom. You read that example. It's mutualism. This one, parasitism. And this one, commensalism.
just to give you a couple more examples of you know what these relationships look like.